Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Great to be with you this morning. I'm Dave Bittler. I'm the pastor here at St. John Hill United Church of Christ. Glad that you could be with us this morning. If you were visiting with us, uh, we wish you a warm welcome. A couple of things I wanted to announce. First, uh, in the back of the narthex on the tables, I have placed uh, some of what I call my outreach cards. Uh, they look a little weird. They've got a book about tattoos on the front of them, and it's got a question about tattoos on the back. That's meant to be there. Um, and if you don't understand why either of those two things are there, you can come talk to me and I'll explain it to you later. Um, but the important thing on it, it has at the bottom, on this side, it has my name, my cell phone number, and my email address. Please take one of these, hang it on your refrigerator. Um, when you see it, pray for me. Know that I'm praying for you. Uh, take a couple extra. I have lots. Um, if you know somebody uh, who would like to talk to me or who would benefit by talking to me and would like to reach out to me, you can hand them one of these and tell them that they can reach out to me by email or cell phone 24-7 um, and I will respond. Um, these are for a tool for you to use um, if you would like to say, hey, you should, you know, come meet our new pastor, um, send them to our YouTube channel. They can glimpse of what I look like and what I sound like beforehand, but please use these. Um, uh, please don't hesitate to call if you need something. That's why I'm giving you my cell phone number so that you can find me uh, almost wherever I am, or at least wherever there's cell service in some of these places around here. Uh, it's a little sketchy, but I will get back to you as quick as I can, but they're on the tables in the narthex. Um, also, I've been asked to announce that next Sunday afternoon, uh, there's going to be a group who uh, are going to do a little caroling trip around to um, some of our members who have not been able to attend services because of COVID. Uh, masks will be worn while singing outside and precautions will be taken. Uh, if you're interested in bringing some Christmas cheer to any of these shut-ins, please talk to Mayetta. About that, but that will be next Sunday afternoon. Are there any other announcements that we can make this morning for the good of everybody? Just a reminder there will be a consistory meeting right after church this morning. Uh, we'll try to make that one brief. And by brief, I mean you know, less than three hours. <laughs> any other announcements? All right, at this time, let's prepare our hearts for worship as we hear the praise.
Let's hear God's word as he calls us to worship this morning from Psalm 26, a song of ascent. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they sang among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing its sheaves with thee. This time we'll have the lighting of our advent. Sunday in Advent, Jesus is coming. Shout for joy! Joy is a word we see and hear everywhere at Christmas. Joy to the world is the message of the season. Joy is the theme of this day. Two weeks ago, we lit the prophecy candle and remembered those who first spoke the promise of the coming Christ child. Last week, we lit the Bethlehem candle, a symbol of the preparations being made to receive and cradle the Christ child. The third candle on the Advent wreath is called the Shepherd's Candle. It remembers the first in a long line of people who joyfully shared the good news of the Savior's birth. The candle is a different color, reminding us that our period of waiting is half over. Shall 
belong to those who walk on the way. Even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come upon it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion, singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Let us join together in prayer. Holy God, create in us a fountain of joy, stir in us a spirit ready to dance, kindle in us the fire of gladness. Set loose in us songs of praise, for you are the one who comes with the healing and blessing. Amen. The Lord calls us to confession. Let us pray together for him in advance. You actually have to kind of pay attention if you want to appreciate it. Let's pray together the prayer of confession that's found on the screen. This Advent time, we remember Mary and Joseph, giving thanks for their faithfulness, courage, and obedience, stepping out into the unknown in the strength of your spirit, playing their part in the fulfillment of your plan to bring your prodigal people home again. We pray that their example might be the pattern of our lives that when your gentle whisper breaks through the clamor of this world and into our small corner, we might be ready to listen and having listened to act. Let's take a few moments and confess our own private sins to God this morning. Together, let's pray. Our gracious God, we come before you this morning with humble hearts, confessing our sins before you, knowing that you are holy and we are sinful. Yet by the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, we can be made whole, knowing that if we confess our sins, you have promised to forgive us our sins. May your spirit invite our hearts this morning and hear our prayer and forgive us our sins. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul tells us in the book of Romans these very simple words. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to God. We hope by now that you are becoming familiar with our song based on John 3.16. Rose, you want to come up and help us with that? Great.
This morning, our Old Testament reading comes from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 61. We'll be reading the whole chapter, verses 1 through 11. Let's hear God's word this morning. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Strangers shall stand and tend your flocks, Foreigners shall be your plowmen and vine dressers, but you shall be called the priests of the Lord. They shall speak of you as the ministers of our God. You shall eat the wealth of the nations, and in their glory you shall boast. Instead of your shame, there shall be a double portion. Instead of dishonor, they shall rejoice in their lot. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess a double portion. They shall have everlasting for I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrong. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their offspring shall be known among the nations and their descendants in the midst of the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge them, that they are an offspring of the Lord has blessed. I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul shall exalt in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, as a bride adorns herself with jewels. For as the earth brings forth its crowds, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to sprout up, the Lord will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before the nations. And our New Testament reading comes from the Gospel of Luke. Verses 16 through 21, where Jesus gives probably one of the shortest sermons ever recorded. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. 
And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. May God add his blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, would you come now and attend to your word? Would you speak your truth to our hearts? Help us to understand and to apply what you have written so that we may know you better, so that we may become more like Jesus Christ. We ask this in his name. Amen. Business cards are an interesting thing. You meet somebody, hand them out. If you've given any thought to it, you want to make an impression when you hand it to them. You want it to be something that feels nice in their hand. You want something that has... Uh, an image that will capture their attention, that maybe they will remember. You want it to have pertinent information. Part of the reason why I'm still using these is because I haven't come up with a good idea for a new one yet. It's something that you want to give thought to. What do you want people to think about you when, when you meet them and you hand them something? In the Gospel of Luke, in the passage that we read today, it's very interesting. I've told you uh, before that context is always very important for a passage of Scripture. And before Jesus comes into Nazareth to deliver this sermon, which we'll talk about what this means, it's interesting to note what has happened right before this. What gives Jesus the right to say these words and to make these claims? Well, at the beginning of chapter 4, we find that Jesus goes into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. He experiences long periods without food. He's very hungry. And we see that Satan is not an easy adversary to overcome. He knows the places to, to hit. He knows Jesus is hungry. Command these stones to become bread. He knows that Jesus is claiming to be the king of the world. And he knows what Jesus has to do in order to ascend to that level of power. He has to give himself up. So Satan says, I'll give you a shortcut. I'll give you all the kingdoms which are already mine if you will just worship 
And in all of these things, Jesus remains faithful to the word of God. Where the first Adam failed, the second Adam prevailed. And so he passes the test and he comes in and he announces, he gives his calling card, he comes to his hometown. Nazareth is not a big town, it's not a bustling center of commerce. It's a backwoods, hillbilly kind of town. So much so that the disciples would ask, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nothing happens there. And then Jesus comes and he begins reading from the prophet Isaiah, the passage that we read this morning. When he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. The word anointed is very important. In the Hebrew Old Testament, right, the word anointed, the anointed one is where we get our word Messiah. That's what Messiah means. It just means the anointed one, the one who has God's anointing. In the New Testament, in the Greek, they take that same word Messiah and it's translated as the word Christos, which is where we get our word Christ. In case you were confused, Christ is not Jesus' last name. It's his title. It's Jesus, the anointed one. Jesus, the Messiah. Jesus, the Christ. And he makes the claim for himself. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and He has anointed me. He has set me apart for this purpose. And Jesus gives us the purpose that He sees is the reason that He had to come. During these weeks of Advent, we consider the coming of Jesus. And we think about what it means to us that he has come, and what it means to us that he is coming again. Did you ever stop to wonder, what did it mean to Jesus to be the one who was to come? This passage gives us a glimpse as to what was in the mind of Jesus about himself. Why am I here? He says, let me give you my business card. Let me tell you what it is that I'm doing here. Why it is that I am to come. And if we take that and we kind of deconstruct it into our own lives, we can kind of get a glimpse of what should I be looking for. Because we've said over and over again, the disciples, the Jews, they were looking for an anointed one who would deliver them from their political and military enemies. That was the problem that they thought they needed to have solved. Someone to boot out the Romans. Jesus never makes a claim that he's going to do that. Instead, look at what he says. He said, because he has anointed me one to proclaim good news to the poor. The word poor could also be translated to the afflicted. Good news. It's where we get the word gospel. Good news to the poor. What does it mean to be poor? Generally, it just means that you lack something. Generally, we think of it in economic terms that you lack money. But you could also be poor in health. 
where you lack good health, being sick all the time, being afflicted with illness. But later we will read when Jesus gives the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 and in other places, he speaks of, blessed are the poor in spirit. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? Well, what is it? What it means? It means to recognize that we have a lack of spiritual righteousness. We lack. Whether we're willing to admit it or not, we are poor people. The reason why this is hard for us is because we spend our lives working for comfort. We're trying to create our own comfort through our wealth, through our possessions, through our family, through our jobs, through those outward things which bring us pleasure. But as we looked at last week in Isaiah chapter 40, when God speaks comfort, he's speaking of something far greater. If the world could provide it, we wouldn't need God. We wouldn't need an anointed one. We wouldn't need a Christ to come at all. What we need is something that only he can provide. Good news to the poor. What is good news to the poor is that you will no longer be lacking anything. We will no longer be lacking a spirit that seeks to please God. Because that's all Jesus does. Every action that he takes, every word that he speaks is designed to be pleasing to his Father. Jesus is not poor in spirit. He is rich in spirit because he is working to please God. So he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives. We live in the United States of America. We don't like to think of ourselves as being captive or slave to anyone. But we are. We are captive, enslaved to those things that would pull us away from God's glory, from proclaiming God's glory in our lives. Those things are called idols. And the reason why it's hard for us to see them is in our culture today, idols are those things that make us comfortable. They're those things that we cling to, that we hold on to, things like family. Money, our house, our possessions, those things make us comfortable. And they very easily become idols because we want to rely more on them than we want to look to God for our comfort and happiness. Jesus is saying, I have come to proclaim liberty to captives. If you don't think you're in captivity, then why are you going to hear his message? Why is his coming going to be good news for you? We need to identify that we are poor people. Not only are we poor people, but we are captive people. We are captive to our own desires, our own idols. He has sent me to proclaim good news to the poor, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Like I said, the hardest thing for us to do sometimes is to admit that we can't see our own failings. We can't see the places that we are trusting in physical things rather than trusting in God. It's not that those physical things are bad. Most oftentimes, they are blessings from God himself. But when we stop seeing them as blessings from God, we start seeing them as those things in which we put our trust. 
It's very hard to see. Like I said, Satan doesn't fight fair. He wants to make the good things in life seem too good. They're good things. How can that be bad? How can it be bad for me to want to have a good job and to provide for my, my family? How can it be bad for me to want to spend time with my family? How can it be bad for me to want to have nice things, a, a reliable car, a nice house? Those things aren't bad in and of themselves. But if our faith and our hope for our comfort is, in life is in those things, we are worshiping those things and not God. They become our God. I had a seminary professor tell me a story one time where he uh, invited his class. He said, we're going to talk about prayer. And he said, he said to the class, he said, how many of you would like to be a millionaire? Everybody's saying no. He said, good. He said, so while we're in this class, I want you to pray every day that God will make you a millionaire. I just kind of looked at him a little bit. He said, that's your assignment in this class. So you've got the freedom, you've got the permission it's my assignment to you, you are to pray every day while this class is going on that God will make you a millionaire. A week or two goes by. He says, so let's do a homework check. How many of you have done your homework and you've prayed every day that God would make you a millionaire? After a couple weeks, about half the hands were still up. This is all right, just keep going. Another couple of weeks go by, about a month later, he asked him again, he says, said, all right, homework check time. How many of you have prayed every day that God would make you a millionaire? Only one hand went up. He says, okay. He looked at the guy, he said, keep going. Another couple of weeks go by. He comes in and says, he looks at the guy and he says, he said, are you still praying every day that God would make you a millionaire? He said, no. He said, I stopped last week. He said, I'll come back to you. He said to the rest of the class, he said, why did you stop praying that God would make you a millionaire? Well, you can probably imagine the responses that he got. Well, I didn't really think, you know, that you were serious about this. I really didn't think, you know, God would do it. You know, those kind of things. And he comes back to the, the gentleman who had prayed the longest. And he said, tell me your story. He said, he said, Prof, he said, I, I got to tell you, he said, I've wanted all my life to have a lot of money. He said, you giving us this assignment, he said, man, I was all in for it because I thought, now I got the permission, I got a good reason, I can pray for God to make me a millionaire. He said, I prayed every day. He said, with earnestness, I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. And the professor looked at him and said, why did you stop? He said, well, I began to think about, as I was praying, what I would do with a million dollars. And I began to think about things that I would buy and investments that I would make. And then I would think about how could I, you know, increase that and, and to have more than that. And he said, the more I began to think about the amount of time and effort I would have to put into keeping and growing that million dollars, I realized that I was going to have less and less time to spend with my wife and my kids. Having that money would be a good thing, but it was going to encompass me. It was going to destroy the things that I really held dear, my family and those relationships with people that I care about. He said, last Tuesday, I decided I didn't want the million dollars anymore. 
So I stopped praying. See, that's what prayer does. We don't pray to change God's mind. We pray so that God will change ours. And in that prayer, he discovered his own blind spot. He discovered that though he wanted to be rich, he was really poor. Where he thought that that amount of money would make him freer to do the things that he wanted, to have the things that he wanted, he realized that that money was actually going to make him more of a captive that he was not going to be at liberty, that that money was actually going to oppress him and to shut out the things that he loved the most. Brothers and sisters, when we come to understand why Jesus came, the only way that we can understand it is if we truly understand our own shortcomings. It is a universal, amazing, cataclysmic thing that Jesus came from heaven to earth to be a man. It's only happened once in all of history. It's not an everyday thing. It's not a commonplace occurrence. So you better bet that the reason for it is universal and cataclysmic. The need for it was so great. If we come to Christmas another year and we just go, oh, yeah. Jesus came, baby in the manger, away in the manger, cows and the sheep were there, and the baby's there, and Mary and Joseph took from Awareness. Oh, isn't that nice? Friends, that's not Christmas. Christmas is good news for the poor. If you don't realize you're poor, it's not good news for you. It's good news for the captive, for the oppressed, for those who are afflicted. If that's not you, then the birth of Jesus isn't going to mean much to you. But if we understand how much sin has ruined and wrecked our lives, how captive we are to it, how poor we are because of it, how it has enslaved us in its grasp, then when we look to Jesus, as the one who comes and says, I can free you from that. That's the Christmas gift I want. To be free of the things that truly bind my heart. That truly weigh me down. That truly cause me to neglect the God who created me and the God who loves me. That's the Christmas present I want. The one that shatters those chains and makes me truly free. That's what Jesus came to do. That's the calling card, the business card that he comes and says, here's who I am, here's what I've come to do. Would you like to do business with me? Because what I'm offering, you can get from nowhere else. But you can only have it you truly understand your need for it. Otherwise, you won't want it. My prayer for us this year is that we'll recognize our need for it. And we'll rejoice at the coming of the Savior who breaks chains and sets us free. In response to God's word, let's affirm together what we believe by reciting the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, 
and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Are there prayer requests or notes of praise that we can bring before the Lord and the family this morning? So let's go before the Lord this morning and lift these and any unspoken requests before the throne of God. Our gracious God, we thank you for your word to us, or we thank you for the gift of Jesus. Lord, we thank you that not only he came as a baby, but he came, he died, he came back to life, and he now rules and reigns with you, forever interceding for us on our behalf. And so, Lord, we come this morning raising these requests to you. And, Lord, also all of the unspoken requests that uh, remain on our hearts. Father, we would ask that you would Take these cares from us, these anxieties, these worries, and allow us to place them in your hands, to give them over to you. Lord, that your will might be done, and that we would rest in peace knowing that you are good, and that you will bring forth your good in all circumstances. Father, would you help us to be your hands and feet, your words of comfort to those who are hurting. Lord, that like Jesus himself, we can be proclaimers of good news to the poor and the afflicted. Help us, Lord, to fulfill your mission. To be proclaimers of the gospel, not only in our words, but also in our actions. Not so that people would look at us, but so that people would look to you. Help us, O oh Lord, by your spirit, we pray. And help us. Father, as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples and so us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In response to God's word, let us sing our closing carol, Angels from the Realms of Glory.
May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you now and forever. Thank you.